This is Annie of ByAnnie.com and Patterns by Annie. Thank you so much for joining us today for Live with Annie. As usual, we've started the stream a bit early. This helps us get everything set up and broadcasting properly to our various platforms. You can find a countdown clock on the screen showing how long it will be until we actually go live. While you wait, please connect with us and other viewers in the chat. Let us know where you are from and whether you're a new or longtime viewer. We'll see you live soon! again for joining us for Live with Annie. We are so happy to have you with us today. While you wait for the program to start, we hope you'll enjoy the content playing on screen. There's so much inspiration, so take a moment to tell us what you love in the chat. Don't forget there is a countdown clock on the screen so you know how long until we go live.
Hi, it's Annie again reminding you that we'll be going live with this week's episode shortly. There is a countdown clock on the screen showing how much time is left. You've got just enough time to grab some water or a beverage of your choice and a snack and to connect with us in the chat. We'd love to hear what you've been working on this week. to remind you that we'll be starting this week's live very shortly. We've got a really fun episode planned for today, and we'll see you soon. Hi, I'm Annie of ByAnnie.com and Patterns by Annie. Thank you so much for joining us for episode 36 of season 2 of Live with Annie. Welcome to September. Can you believe that Labor Day has already come and gone? This year has just completely flown by. Here at By Annie, we are in crunch mode, working to get ready for quilt market in Houston at the end of October. We're finalizing new and updated patterns and preparing to film add-on and marketing videos for all of those. That means making lots of models to showcase both new patterns and new fabrics. I had a very long weekend home alone, so I took full advantage of it to get some major cutting done. I want to say thank you to everyone who sent good wishes and encouraging words as I faced a mountain of cutting. I managed to get almost 30 projects cut out and off to our model maker, in-house testers, and me. Now I just need to clean up the mess that my cutting tornado created and start sewing again. 
We want to thank you all for joining us. It's always a treat to see our regular viewers joining us from all over the world and to welcome new viewers too. We know that there are so many things you could all be doing with this time and we always really appreciate it when you make time to be with us. If you enjoy these episodes, we hope that you'll give us some hearts or thumbs up and also that you'll take a minute to follow us wherever you are watching. And if you know someone else who you think might enjoy the information that we share, we'd love it if you'd tell them about Live with Annie too. The easiest way to do that is to just tag them while you're watching because that will take them directly to the episode and they can watch it too. If tagging is new to you, just type the at symbol followed by the name that they use on the platform you're tagging them from. Their picture and name will pop up so you can make sure you've got the right person. If you do, click on it, type a comment, and submit it. Also, we really love reading your comments, so please be sure to interact with us throughout this presentation. Since we can't be together in person, having an online conversation is the next best option. And finally, if you have any questions as we go through today's episode, please be sure to add them in the comments and we will do our best to answer them before we close. Last week we answered a wide range of questions about everything from quilting soft and stable to why we don't sell PDFs. If you missed it or want to watch it again, remember that you can find all the previous episodes of Live with Annie on our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, or at byannie.com. We will put up all the links to make them easy for you to find. Today, I am so excited to talk with an amazing artist who makes quilts using an unusual medium, salvaged wood. Laura's work merges contemporary issues such as climate change and the environment with traditional folk art practices such as needlework, quilting, and woodworking. Most of Laura's wood quilts are made using reclaimed materials from natural disasters. When her family's house was flattened in Hurricane Sandy several years ago, Laura took wood from the wreckage to reclaim home. Her work is colorful and bright, proving that there's room for light and restoration after tragedy. Laura's art has been created in diverse spaces, such as the 2013 Arctic Circle Residency in Svalbard, Norway and her work has been published in several national and international publications, including television, books, magazines, podcasts, and NPR. Personally, I am thrilled that the quilt pictured behind Laura in the picture we used to announce this hangs in a place of honor in my home, and I'm expanding my collection, which you'll see soon. Laura is a graduate of Dickinson College where she obtained her BA in Fine Art and English Literature before acquiring her Masters of Science in Fashion Design from Drexel University and an MFA in Studio Arts from Moore College of Art and Design. Please help me welcome Laura Petrovich Cheney. Hi, thank you so much, Annie. This is such an honor. I, I love what you do. And this is great. So thanks for joining me today in my studio in Marblehead, Massachusetts, where I've lived here since 2017. So welcome, wow. everybody. Hello. I am going to um, I am going to just make, basically because of the delay going back forth, I'm just going to turn this over to you. I want you to tell us a little bit about your background, where you live, what brought you to making art using repurposed materials, why quilts and um, how you do it all. So I'm just going to turn this all over to you and let you take it away. Sounds great. Thank you so much. So in 2013, Hurricane Sandy came. My husband and I were living in Asbury Park at the time, and my parents had a shore house in Tom's, near Tom's River, New Jersey. And after the storm, we all know what happened. Everything was completely flattened. And I'd been doing this work a little bit Prior to Hurricane Sandy, I had found two boats on the beach that had come up during a nor'easter, and I took them and didn't know what to do with them for about two years. And then one day, I'm at a grocery store, I'm in line, and I see this magazine, Decorate Your Home with Quilts. Now, I was a self-taught quilter since I was about 17, 
and I hadn't been making quilts for a while. And I thought, ooh, let me see what this is about. Maybe I could find something to do. And there it was. This quilt was orange and turquoise blue, like the two goats that I found. And I thought, wow, this is like a little gift from the universe. I can make a wood quilt just like this picture. So I did. So I've been doing this for a little while, making these boats, and I found some barn wood and some fencing, and I was getting shows, the books were selling, and I was really panicked because I was running out of wood, and then Hurricane Sandy came, and I'm, it, it was a disaster. And what I didn't realize was the world had given me more supplies than I'll ever know what to do with. For example, let me show you this. This is really great. So in in one of the trash piles that was on the side of the road was a dresser. And this dresser was pink and, and purple. And this little girl had decorated it with stickers like Hannah Montana. I mean, who could resist this? And it's purple. And I, I couldn't believe it. And then kitchen cabinets, um, so outdoor siding, trim, a beadboard from a ceiling and a porch. You name it, I found it. Look, even this great shape like this. So it just made sense as a sewer and as a quilter that this is what I would do. And I want to show you today how similar both quilting and woodworking and what I do is exactly the same and how this idea in my head existed so seamlessly. So here's this pattern here that I have, and it is a kind of riff on a log cabin quilt. Now, some of the wood I had traded with a California artist. She and I um, both love bright colors and abstract patterns. So I thought, ooh, how fun to kind of, you know, give a little bit of a, a trade. Because, you know, quilters do fabric swatches and trades all the time. So why shouldn't two artists who work in wood do the same thing? It, it all makes sense when you're a quilter. So one of the things I wanted to do was go back to a tried and true pattern when I was using somebody else's material so that it could feel like me. And so that's what I've done here. And what I'm going to show you is how I'm going to make this. So I have a one inch square and that's my center. And I'm going to show you how I take a floorboard and this is just an oak floorboard. Um, and think of this like salvaged fabric or not salvaged fabric. I'm sorry. Um, a whole bolt of fabric. So if I were to go to the fabric store, I'd get a yard or two. Well, my material, is stored a lot like a fabric shop. So I'm gonna go over here and show you. And I put it in barrels. And some of the things that I have here are like police barricades that got destroyed. Um, church signs that had fallen off. Um, more print, you name it, I have it. So I keep the large stuff in barrels, just like a fabric store, and then I'll cut them down into smaller shapes. So what I'm gonna show you here is I'm taking this, it's about you know two feet, and I'm gonna cut it down to four inches. And then I'm gonna take it and cut it down even smaller to one by two to fit that little square. Now, this is a chop saw or miter saw. If you've ever seen your rotary cutters, it works exactly the same, just bigger. And what it's sitting on is my table saw. And that's when I cut really long strips of wood on this. Now, I like to think of my fashion design degree as it is a science degree because we're working with tools and numbers and shapes. And your sewing machine and your quilting machines are all tools. And you have to respect the tools for safety and the things that you do. So as much as I love jewelry and I love my long hair and clothes, I'm basically obsessed with safety in here. So the first thing I'm going to do is just pull my hair back so it doesn't get caught in anything. I have no rings, no big earrings, no jewelry, nothing, because safety is so important. And I know that sewers, when they think of their sewing machine, they're also safety. You don't have big, loose, flowing sleeves when you sew because you'll sew into it, <laughs> or at least I have once or twice. So I'm gonna cut here, 
And I've already pre-marked this and I'll show you how I do that too. So I just line it up here, make sure it's flat, just like sewers cut their stuff. I'll hold it here and we'll just cut. And so just like everybody at home has two yards of fabric, you need to cut some strips down. This is the same exact thing. So now I'm going to come back over here and show you how this gets even smaller. So for me, this process was really seamless when I saw that turquoise and orange quilt because everything I've done my whole life has been quilting. I taught myself at 17 how to quilt because my mother would not um, buy me an antique quilt and I was determined because, you know, teenagers, when they're told no, they'll find some way to get what they want. And what I had done was uh, babysat and saved up money for a sewing machine. I bought it, took a little, went down to my local fabric store, bought fabric, and got a pattern. A day, and a, my first one was the log cabin quilt, a day, you know, sew a quilt in a day. And I had no idea what seam allowance was. And I sewed as close as I could to the edge. Man, that quilt was a disaster. So what I've done here is I use my quilting ruler and I've marked the one inch by two inch first row of logs for this one inch center pink square. Now this is a little bit too small for me to do over there. So I'm gonna bring it over to my bandsaw and show you how I'm gonna reduce this smaller. And this piece of equipment is probably the one that I use the most. It has um, a sense of familiarity to, to a sewing machine in that it has a wheel here and a wheel at the bottom. So it operates similarly to the sewing machine. And I have the throat here, just like a sewing machine needle goes up and down. But the sewing machine puts the fabric together. And in this case, I reduce it to the shapes that I need. These tools here um, are what I use for hands if I need to manipulate it so it doesn't get close. Um, if the wood hits a knot in here, sometimes it could jump and, um, you know, it, it can, these are just really safe things to have. Um, I am comfortable getting close because I keep this really shallow. This goes up and down, so if I have to cut really thick wood, I can do that. There is this gauge here, so if I need to have something really tight and perfect, I'll do that. But for the most part, I've been doing this long enough that I don't really like using what's called the fence, unless I'm ripping wood, like a four-inch piece of wood. So I'm going to lower this to where it feels safe and comfortable for me. And there's a wheel back here that can tighten it. So the first thing I'm gonna do is, you can see this here, the line. I'm gonna cut that line off first, then I'll cut this, and then I'll cut them into those shapes. It's gonna be a little noisy. So that's how that works. 
Um, you can see that I get pretty close and this really helps push it. All these little marks are from when the blade had hit this to go in there like that. Now I'm left with some kind of um, fuzz for a better word, wood fuzz, just like we all have fuzz in our quilts and you can see that. So what I'll do now is I'll sand this and think of it like ironing. So I hope everyone can see how, you know, it's, it's so funny because I was asked, well, how did you get this idea? But when you've quilted for 30 years, it just made so much sense, this process. So let me go over to my sander and show you how this works. Now this machine, sometimes if my wood's old, I'll wear a ton of safety equipment for this. But in this case, I'm just gonna sand these real, real quick. Um, I have a lot of woodworking equipment in here that might not be like a sewing machine. And one is this air filtration system. And I'll put it on so everyone can get an idea of what that sounds like. It's pretty loud. And then when this thing gets going. Oh man, there's a lot of noise. So you can imagine what this is like all day in here with this. Oh, Pete, I'm here. <laughs> Pete's my husband. He's doing the camera. He's a gym teacher, not a professional film operator. So I, we apologize for that. So there's quite a bit of noise in here and all day, six to eight hours in here can be a real problem. So let me show you some of the things that I use that probably might not be needed in a quilt room. So the first thing I would do is my head my ear protection. So if I'm sanding a lot and I have a lot of things going on, this helps. Now with the sander, I don't know, you know, sometimes we like to iron all the fabric at once. You'll sew. I know when I was making a quilt in a day, how you can sew, chain sew your things together. So you'll sew your rows after row after row and then cut them and do multiple ironing. I'll do the same thing. I'll make multiple cuts put them in the area, then I'll make multiple sanding. And it, when I do that, this is the um, some of the equipment that I use. The wood's old. So this is the respirator that I use and the headset that I use. Really attractive, right? So this helps. And if I'm just sanding a couple of pieces and I want to be safe, I'll put this on as well. So this is probably, we're all familiar with these, right? This is easy because it can go up and down all day. So that's some of the real safety issues that I use all the time in here that I, that I don't in a quilt room, obviously. So I have my piece here and I have my one inch pink piece and I have my one inch by two inch gray piece and I will just go around the logs like this. Now this gray is gonna need a lot of sanding because the wood, the oak flooring has these um, bevels in it that I, I'll wanna get real smooth. And I don't know if you can see that, so I'll, I'll hold this up. But there it is, it's the first row of a log cabin. And I will glue them. And you can see that I've got these. And I'll probably go around with, I'd say the yellow next and do the same thing. So I know now that this yellow has to be one by three. And I make each piece as I do it. I find that wood can be so temperamental um, that I like to measure it just just when you piece together your squares, you think they're, and they should all be two inches, but sometimes they're two and an eighth or two and a quarter because they've stretched on the bias or maybe your seam allowance wasn't exactly what it should be. So it happens here with me as well. So right now this is one and three inches. So I'll mark that here. And I'm hoping everyone's finding this process interesting, familiar, 
so I'll mark it here. And what's great is um, you can't mark on the fabric, or at least I never drew on the fabric. Uh, I never wrote on it, so but I can here, which is really terrific. So it gives me a nice cutting line. And the pencil width is about the width of my blade. And that's something else to keep into consideration is how wide that blade is. This is a really tiny blade on the bandsaw, but the miter saw is much thicker. Now, there's other kinds of quilts besides the log cabin. And we have the curves. And one of the things that I really love about this is English paper piecing. And everyone's like, well, how do you do English paper piecing in wood? And the piece that I did for Annie's piece and this one here um, using the clammy is the same thing. I'm using contact paper because what happens is each one of these will come out very differently. Even though I do have a stencil, even though I am using the ruler, I, cutting on a curb is one of the most challenging things to do. And I can sometimes um, make mistakes and get things a little wonky. So sometimes they can be a little bigger on one side, a little smoother. So I want each one to fit nicely. So I'll take the piece of contact paper and I'll take this. I don't, how are we getting, can we see this clearly or should I move closer? Maybe I'll move closer. Yeah, I can too. Here, let's go in here. Is this better, Pete? So I'll show you here without the grid on the piece, how I handle English paper piece. So I have my stencil here. And I don't know if that will be precise to what it is that I'm working on. So I have my original pieces laid out here where I want them in the stencil. So like that. So what I'll do now is I will carefully lift the stencil And I will go in and trace these to where they are. And, you know, I never have done an English paper piece in quilt, so I can't believe I did it in wood first. Sometimes I'll use double stick tape to hold these pieces in place. And so now, I have that shape, it's a little off, here on this contact paper. So then what I'll do is I want this shape to be red. So I will take the contact paper. I'm going to go over and get my scissors. I learned to keep all my tools on a magnet like Julia Child. She used to keep her knives on a magnet. I keep all my hammers and scissors. It's so great to have little tools like that in your workspace. So at the end of the day, it just makes cleanup easy and you don't have to think about where they go. You just get stuck on the magnet. So here's the shape that I want. That's extra contact paper. I'll save it. Now, cutting on curves is a little dangerous. So usually I don't ever think about the type of species of wood that I do on something like this because I have the confidence to cut anything. But I know when I'm working on a really hard wood like oak or a mahogany or um, a primarily oak, it's going to be a challenge. So I'm looking for things like pine. And this is a piece of a, a kitchen that had been demolished. A guy owned a series of pizza shops and his kitchen was red, like a pizzeria. I can't imagine living in a red kitchen. So now the contact paper is here. I'll place it on this shape. And then I will cut that. And that's how my paper piecing, I don't call it English paper piecing, but it's paper piecing will work. And so I'll just cut those out. And I love, 
I love doing these complicated pieces. Um, they are a challenge. And one of the things that happens is when I do a challenge like this, I'll always work on two pieces because I can only do this for a while before I'm like, holy smokes, this is so hard. I'm making so many mistakes. This is such a challenge. Let me just do a couple of straight lines. And so it's always good to have multiple projects. And sometimes I'll even have a little third one going here. This is um, a couple of things that I've been working on, these little house quilts. Um, these are so cute. I love doing them. They're fun to do and they're quick and easy and use a lot of the scraps because I never throw anything away. I'm sure you're wondering, so where do I store all these scraps? What happens, you know, from this size when it gets cut smaller and smaller? I'll show you. There's a couple things that I have. So the real tiny pieces are here. Like, oh my goodness, look how cute they are. Like, look how cute this is. Like, how could you ever get rid of something so green and so great to use later for a little space somewhere? Or, or these tiny little, look at that little gray. I, I know you quilters don't ever throw these out either. I know you keep them somewhere in a little mason jar. Look at this little triangle. And if you're wondering, did I make anything that small? Yeah, over there in the corner is a postage stamp quilt with one inch by one inch um, pieces. And some of them have the little half inch triangles like this because you just don't throw anything away. Why would you? Stuff is so fun. So a um, couple other pieces that are really fun to know about my process. So Hurricane Sandy was about uh, seven, eight years, oh, actually 10 years ago um, next year. And do I find wood locally? Yes, sometimes from um, storms that happen and sometimes just from demolitions. And sometimes somebody, can you imagine, threw out a little nightstand with this painted. Who would ever put this on the garbage. I was walking my dog in the morning and we found this and I had a, I mean, it was garbage day. Garbage day for me is the ultimate sale day. It's like 50% off or buy one, get one. It's just great. Big bulk of garbage. Look at this. I cannot wait to use this. This is going to be great. Behind me are my irons. Um, no, I'm not ironing the wood flat. Wood, once it's glued, has to be pressed down. Um, you want to always press. Again, think about your sewing. You want to press open those seams. I want to press down the glue. I can't get a clamp in here, and I don't work up. And I, I you know, what happens in the middle? I can clamp the edges, but I got to get in the middle. So I will put these irons down for it to dry. And we know that each one of these is probably about two or three pounds. This one here is 10. You can do your weights, ladies. You can work out with these guys. Here's another uh, 10 pound right here. So you can exercise in between your, your work. So, and that holds everything down, glues it. Sometimes I'll make a frame to hold it in place. I just love it. It's, it's like a blast in here. It's so much fun. And it's everything I could imagine doing. It's the best of both worlds. It's my quilting from when I was a teenager. Um, and it's my art degree. And it's my fashion degree. It's, it's everything. I can't imagine a better way to spend a life. So. That, I think she's ready for me to go. That is fabulous, Laura. I so, so enjoyed seeing how that all comes together and hearing the story of how you started as a quilter. And I know that every one of us can totally relate to that. My husband was a woodworker and so I did a lot of building houses and cabins and furniture and stuff with him. And I always said, sewing is so much easier because you can stretch something to fit or sew a bigger seam. So it was really fun to see how you um, sand and, and use your bandsaw to, to make things fit. I especially loved seeing uh, the paper piecing, how you put the clamshells together. And I'm not sure if people keyed in on that, but 
but the ruler that you're using to mark those is an actual quilting ruler. A lot of the rulers that you use for marking your pieces are quilting rulers too. So um, when people get tired of sewing, I've, I said as I was watching your videos and things, I, I'm really seriously thinking that a bandsaw uh, might be the next thing I purchase. But uh, for now, I'm going to just appreciate what you've done. Um, I want it, if you have time, if you could take a minute and talk about this quilt um, which is my newest addition to my collection and is one that when you were talking about how when you're working on something um, kind of hard you like to have something easier to work in and I think you said this was one that you were working on in conjunction with another. Can you tell us a little bit about this quilt? Sure, sure. Back, you know, when I was um, in the fashion industry, I didn't have a lot of time to make quilts, but I still was really interested in quilts. And it was about 2000 or 1999 when the G-Spend quilts came to, um, to Whitney. And I'd actually seen that exhibit twice. And so seeing the G-Spend quilts reignited my love. And a few years after that, I went back to graduate school because I missed making. And I credit the reintroduction and the resurgence of quilts in my own life to seeing that exhibit. And so this summer when I was making that piece, I had a 14-year-old assistant here who wanted to learn about woodworking and art. And I was swearing so much at making a very complicated piece, but I couldn't swear because she's 14. So I just kept saying, geez Louise. Oh golly geez. And I just kept saying geez all the time instead of other things. And then here I find this little teeny tiny letter G sticker on a piece of desk furniture that had been put together. You know this uh, box furniture that you get that's labeled A B C. So I found this little tiny beautiful G sticker and I put it on there and I named it G's in honor of the G's friends quilts because it's very um, improvisational. I made it when I could no longer deal with the structure and the formality of the piece that I was working on and just wanted to be playful and free and easy. And that's how that piece came about. And that's how this one's going to wind up. Playful, easy, because I can have fun with that. This is going to be very particular, a lot of sanding, a lot of measuring, and I, here I can just kind of go wild like I did with that. You know, Andy, you, you brought up a good point that you can always stretch fabric if you suddenly have, to, you know, you have a lot of space and you need to fill it. What I do is with these teeny, tiny little pieces, and I'll show you how tiny, this is a small piece of a ruler, and this is real small. I'll cut tiny little slivers in to fill in the gaps if I have them. In fact, I have one here. This piece is so beautiful and I, I couldn't get rid of it. And it's just the edge of a piece. And so I'll use these as fillers. So nothing ever disappears. And it's good to have them on hand. And by the time this small, a story by size. Most of them, when they're about this big, get stored by color. So these are all about, I don't know, eight to ten inches. So anything that's eight to ten inches in the box, labeled as color, when it gets smaller, it goes by size. And I that's just how I also arranged my fabrics, by, by color initially and then by size. So, yeah. That's that's awesome. Yeah, I noticed on this one, there's a spot right here where you've got a little tiny um, red edge of a strip stuck in there to, to fill in the spot. So that's yeah. fabulous. One, one thing that, that I thought it would be nice for you to mention, if anyone who's watching today is interested in seeing more of your work, maybe seeing it in person or acquiring one of your masterpieces, um, where can they get more information? On my website, laurakane.com, and that's L-A-U-R-A.com. Laura, -A -A um, I do have a gallery, 
in Provincetown, but my website is also fantastic. So email me as well at lauracinia.com. So my website is pretty much home base. Great. That's awesome, yeah, and I think we've put that up on the screen a few times, so hopefully people can go there. I wanted to um, go on now if there were any questions that came in. Um, it looks like there's only one, and I'm, I think you've already answered it, but someone asked, are those old-fashioned irons behind you on the back wall? And uh, yeah. how many of those have you got there that you use? Um, you know, I think I have about 20. And one of the reasons why I started collecting them was when I was in fashion, they had these very fancy fabric holders. When you're sewing patterns, you know this, Annie, you don't put pins on the paper because that pin puckers and doesn't give an accurate cut. And when you're using, you know, $100 silk charmeuse, you are not putting your pin in there. So they would have um, fabric weights to hold that pattern down so you could cut. Well, I couldn't afford the fabric weights, but I could afford these things. And when I had done with them, when I was a fashion designer, I put velvet on them so that they were clean and smooth. And that's how I started using these as weights um, at the time. And these at an antique store were two or three dollars. Now they're a little bit more than that, um, but that's how it started. So the process of holding things down with these irons was so seamless in my mind. I'd also like to show you something else. We talked about this before, a sketchbook. And I always want to encourage um, quilters and artists to have a sketchbook in, in close by for notes, um, ideas, because the best kind of ideas come when you're working. You know, inspiration is, what is it, 95% perspiration. And so as I'm working, this is when my next piece happens. It's always when I'm about three quarters of the way done. I'm still here, but I'm dreaming about the next possibility. And I don't want to lose that idea. So I'll, I'll keep them here. The other thing I always do is write down my mistakes because we learn best from our mistakes. And this is one of mine, you know, cardinal rule. Can you tell I'm also a school teacher? <laughs> <laughs> telling other artists what to do in the studio. I do apologize, but I have to tell you, this is one of the greatest secrets that artists keep is a sketchbook by them all the time. And it's so great to go back and look at ideas. Like here's a, a picture that I printed out of a quilt and someone's painting. And I'm constantly looking and sourcing paintings, ideas, try something to do here. Um, Well, do you want to put me back on? Looks like we lost Laura there, right there at the end. I'm guessing that maybe something came unplugged, although I'm not sure. We'll see if she can come back in. In the meantime, I wanted to remind you to please be sure to go to her um, website because she's got a lot of great pictures there. She's also got some really good videos um, that she filmed, um, different museums and stuff where she's given uh, lectures and things. She's got one where she shows you know, how she draws out the pattern and places the pe pieces on that, how she glues the pieces in place and talks about all of that. So. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to get her back here, so so maybe we'll just keep on going. Um, I think we were pretty much done, but I didn't get a chance to say goodbye, so I'll have to say goodbye to her later. Um, you want to go on down, Glow? The other way. So um, what I found especially um, moving about Laura's um, story is how she took the pieces from the disaster of Hurricane Sandy and use those to really honor and celebrate life. So um, she's got a lot of pictures in there of her family's home that was destroyed. So be sure and check that out. And um, again, it's always fun to see how someone takes something that we love to do, quilting with fabric, and um, turn it into another type of art. I especially loved her just exuberant uh, excitement about the little 
triangles and the little pieces because I think all of us who sew can totally relate to that. It's really hard to throw away scraps because you can always see a purpose with it for them. So I want to again say thank you to Laura. I'm sorry she's not here in person to say goodbye, uh, but maybe we'll still try and get her back. All right, so I hope you enjoyed seeing Laura's awesome creations, learning more about how she produces them. Again, don't forget to go to her website. You can go down below. I've already said all that. And let's move on now to just some special announcements um, for, for this week. Um, so September is National Sewing Month, and our friends at Shannon Fabrics are again celebrating with a big giveaway for all of the makers who give so much to this industry. They have partnered with 21 other amazing brands, including Biani, to create their most popular giveaway of all time. This time they're going even bigger than ever before and they're going to have three grand prizes worth about 3,000 manufacturers suggested retail price each. And for the first time, each grand prize winner is going to include a sewing machine. So the contest is open to makers in the continental US only. You can enter to win until the very last day of September. And then three winners will be randomly selected on October 3rd. And we put up the link so you can get all the information and enter that contest if you'd like. We also want to remind you that our friends at Shop Hop Inc. have organized two more statewide Shop Hops, which will run from September 1st all the way through October 31st. The All Missouri Shop Pop features 70 stores around the state, and the All Carolinas Hop, which includes both North and South Carolina, features over 80 stores. So be sure to go to their websites to learn more about the shops that are participating, the exclusive fabrics they have, and all their exciting prizes. And again, we'll put up the links so they'll be easy for you to find. Let's move on now to our featured local quilt shops of the week. This week we are featuring two shops, each of whom will have Biani trunk shows over the next few weeks. We're going to start at a store who is participating in the All Carolinas Shop Pop, Quilts Like Crazy and Embroidery in Lake Forest, North Carolina. Originally named Quilts Like Crazy, the business has been around for nearly two decades and has been a staple in the Wake Forest, North Carolina quilting industry. New owner, new owner Carrie Merchant bought the store in September of 2018 and renamed it to Quilts Like Crazy and Embroidery with the goal of continuing the store's extraordinary reputation and striving to exceed expectations. They provide a wide variety of fabrics, quilting and embroidery supplies, sewing and embroidery machine, and lots of biani patterns and supplies as well. They also hold lots of classes and techniques such as English paper piecing, foundation paper piecing, making tuffets, umbrellas, hand embroidery, and machine embroidery. To, sell, to help celebrate their four-year anniversary this month, and in conjunction with the All Carolina Shop Hop, the store will have a biannual trunk show on display throughout the months of September and October. So they're going to have it for two months. They will also be vending at their third annual or their third quilt show this year, which is the Durham Orange Quilters Quilt Show in Mabin, North Carolina, from September, excuse me, from October 21st to the 23rd. Voters in our LQS contest praised the store's selection and customer service. And Rebecca said, the owner of the shop has so much energy and makes every customer feel special. She always has something new in her shop. And Kay agreed, saying, Carrie goes out of her way to help you find what you need. Barbara listed what she loves about the store. The quality and abundance of beautiful, seasonal, and current fabric lines. The friendliness, helpfulness, and kindness of the staff. New projects and ideas. Programs to keep quilters quilting. And they're open to new ideas. All in all, it is an A-plus shop. So again, Quilts Like Crazy and Embroidery will have a Biani trunk show on display in the store from September 1st through October 31st, so be sure to stop in during that time and check it out. And be sure to tell them Annie sent you. I'm going to have a quick drink before I move on to the next store. And since I'm not listening to anything, I'm going to take these headphones out. 
earbuds out. All right, next we are going to travel to a gourmet quilt shop where traditional meets contemporary wooden spool boutique in Odessa, Texas. This fun store opened in 2018 with a few bolts of fabric and a bunch of dreams. Today the shop is overflowing with many bolts of fabric, lots of notions, and wonderful customers who are like family. Owner Marcia Davids and her husband Donnie have a passion for quilting and like to share their knowledge of quilting with each other and their customers. They also have a fabulous team to help with that. Employees Carrie and Carrie spelled two different ways, share their passion with old and new customers alike. Their media specialist, Ruben, is a technology wizard who takes photos of products and posts videos to Facebook and Instagram. Marcia said that they look forward to broadening their social media presence with his help. Patrick is their machine service and repair technician. He can repair and service any brand of machine. If there is a problem with the machine, he is very determined to find it and get it fixed. Wooden Spool Boutique has been voted and won the Reader's Choice Award, the best quilt shop in the Permian Basin for three years running. The store prides itself on excellent customer service, quality quilting fabric, and an extensive selection of notions. They are also proud to be a Quilt of Valor shop and will help award 38 Quilts of Valor quilts to very deserving veterans in October. Voters in this year's contest complimented the friendly staff and good selection at Wooden Spools. Linda said they have friendly owners and everything I might need for quilting or bag making. And Coy wrote, Marcia and her team are always ready to help and have wonderful ideas. She always has the latest fabrics and a wonderful inventory of sewing and quilting products. I am so glad we have this local quilt shop in our city. Wooden Spools Quilt Boutique will have their by Annie Trunk Show on display throughout the month of September, so be sure to stop in and say hello. So, um, Leslie or Casey put a note on and said, Laura just joined on Instagram, said she had a power outage. So that's what happened. Boy, it happened at just the right time. She apologized, but she'd gotten through, I think, everything that um, she wanted to share. So thank goodness that didn't happen a half an hour earlier. So we are really happy. That was Leslie. Okay, thank you, Leslie, for posting that. I appreciate it. And thank you, Laura, for letting us know what happened. Uh, we'll touch base with you later. All right, thank you to everyone who joined us today. We will be back next Wednesday at 2 p.m. Mountain Time with another inspiring episode of Live with Annie. It's back to school time for the kids, so we're going to showcase projects for students. From pencil cases to backpacks, we've got ideas for students of all ages, and you won't want to miss it. So until then, happy stitching. <music>